Welcome to Catherine Raker's World. Innovation. Culture. Adventure. Fashion and health. Artists. Destinations. Traditions. This is Catherine Raker's World. Hi, this is Catherine Raker of Catherine Raker's World. We have a very distinguished guest today with us. His name is Jim Ranker. He is the medical director of long-term care with Volante Diagnostics. Am I correct on that? Director of long-term care. Long-term care. You know, I wonder how you ever started in this this business, and I want to know what Volante is. Can you tell us it's what it is actually? Well, Valente is a, a diagnostics lab um, in the healthcare industry where we specialize in consulting on uh, infectious disease testing and mm -hmm. then actually perform the infectious disease testing. Right, so you're, you're also a lab, am I right? Yes. Lab. And you have more than one, right, in the country? or? Yeah, we, we have nine labs within the uh, U.S. and then we have labs in Dubai and the Emirates and other uh, foreign lab builds that we're in the process of doing right now. Right. Who started the program originally? Well, the, the founder of the company is uh, uh, Dr. Jim Bentley, is one of the ones who come up with very distinct panels. There are some uh, infectious disease testing has been around for about 30 years in terms of the testing. It's actually DNA testing and what we're doing. We test the DNA of bacteria and viral and uh, funguses to, to be able to see their breakdown and, and how they affect the human body. Um, but there's individual panels that have to be tested. And so uh, our founder, uh, Jim Bentley, who runs the lab, is the one who has very distinct panels that he had developed and has taken this to a, a, even a higher level than any other lab in the country right now. How did you start in the business before you went to work? For I was doing what was called pharmacogenetics testing. It's a fancy word that um, is used sometimes up here. PGX is kind of the abbreviation since the word is hard to spell. Um, right. But essentially, what that does, it's it's determining whether or not uh, how an individual person's DNA how they metabolize medications. And we specialized in long-term care. So what's very important there is the average patient in a skilled nursing facility takes on average about. 14 to 15 medications daily. And so it's very difficult to determine whether or not each one of those medications are working properly. And this, what it does is it tests the DNA, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna look at 300 medications and to be able to see whether or not those are metabolized properly. So now you have a guideline for the rest of your life because your DNA does not change of which medications you should or shouldn't be on and they're going to be effective to you. Is it going to tell you if you're allergic to that medication? It's not going to tell you whether you're allergic to it. Resistance. But, but it's, well, no, it's going to tell you whether or not your body metabolizes it. When you take a medication, the medications are broken down in different parts of your bodies, whether it's the kidneys, the liver, the small intestine, the large intestine, your stomach. Each medication, some of them break down in more than one location. Oh, really? And it's very important to be able to see if that medication is absorbed too quickly in your body, then you're going to be getting side effects uh, too fast, but you're only going to get the effect of that medication for a short period of time. Um, the example that is understood a lot easier is pain medications. Mm -hmm. uh, people who don't metabolize pain medications properly may only have the effect of the opioid for maybe an hour and a half in their, in their system. And then they're coming back and saying, I'm hurting more. Well, some physicians and medical staff will look right. and go, I'm worried that this person may be addicted and they're trying to shop for pills or trying to get more medications. They're genuinely in pain again. Uh, but the problem is, is they still have the effect of the reason why you should only take medication for every six hours. Right. They still have the six hours of effect in there but the pain medication part is wore off, so they start taking medication too quickly. And, okay. that's, where, and that's where addiction and things can happen. So we're, when you're on a pain medication, like you hurt your shoulder or whatever, you go to the emergency room, they give you this pain medication. You don't know if you're allergic to it or not because I'm one of those people that is. Mm -hmm. And you go 
come back, they give you two instead of one, and all of a sudden you're itching everywhere and you just want to jump out of your skin. You're not metabolizing that, are you? Yeah, yeah. Now, there can be some that are that are genuine allergies to the medications. Right. Right. Um, but most medications have other compounds that are mixed in to make make a pill where it can actually break down. So you're just not taking the solid medication. Right. The pill itself is not a hundred percent of what that chemical base is. There's a, another base that mixed in, and some people are allergic to those. But this is determining the actual chemical that breaks down in your body where where it's going to be metabolized okay. so there's a drug a very popular cardiac drug called plavix okay and plavix is what's called a black box warning drug and what that means is the fda has on the back of the box a label black box label that says that you should be testing cp219 which is the heart the uh, medications that are used for the heart to determine whether or not a patient metabolizes that medication properly the problem was when this drug came onto the market, the test, the pharmacogenetics test, cost a million dollars. Wow! To run. Well, now, now it's several hundred dollars and could be, and could be run. But the problem is, is a third of the population they know will not metabolize Plavix, and that's why it has a black box warning. Okay, so what does that mean when it goes through your system? Would it come out in chunks? Would it not dissolve? Well, Would it, it not what? For, for most of the time, a a, a drug. Um, that is broken down actually changes its compound. So if you were testing someone for to see if they were on morphine, um, when the morphine would come into your body it actually changes chemical structures and that's how it's absorbed and that's how it breaks down and works. Okay. That you would actually, uh, someone who wouldn't break down a medication would actually expel the medication uh, through the urine exactly the, the same way. It wouldn't have been metabolized. It's literally like it's just passing through a sieve wow. and it's not breaking down properly. Wow. So a lot of the things that you do with Valente Diagnostics is you see how people are resistant to drugs as well as how they metabolize them through their DNA. Well, the two, two, two different tests. Okay. The, the pharmacogenetics is a separate one where we're testing the DNA of a patient. We're going to get cells from the inside of their cheek, mm -hmm. and then we can have a road map for the rest of your life of which medications you should or shouldn't take uh, on there, which is a very helpful tool. But then separately from that is our infectious disease testing. Okay. And what we're doing there is we're testing uh, when someone is potentially have a respiratory issue, someone is having a urinary tract, gastro issues, or, or have a wound in their body, that we are going to want to be able to know, first of all, is this a bacteria, is this a vi virus, or is this a fungus? And then what we're able to do is we test, say, the bacteria, we're going to look at the DNA of the bacteria and break it down. So we want, we want it dead, which is one of the nice things, is shipping it to us. People don't have to have it in a timely manner. They don't have to put it on dry ice. It's not having to be there. We want to test it, the, the uh, bacteria to find the DNA. And then what we can look at is, once we know that a patient has a bacterial infection, we can look and see if that bacteria is actually resistant to certain antibiotic drug classes. So antibiotics are put into certain drug classes, just like cardiac, opioids, psychotics, they're all in different ones. And when right. you break down subcategories, you have, we, we test for about 11 different subcategories of antibiotics. And those antibiotics, uh, if they're resistant, means that that bacteria, which there are millions of bacteria, have now figured out how not to be defended against by that antibiotic. Right, so say for instance, penicillin was around for a long time. Uh, well, guess what? I'm allergic to penicillin. Right. Um, so then all these different cillins came into play, and wasn't there in 2011 an antibiotic Antibiotic. 2011 was the last time a, a new antibiotic had uh, been approved by the FDA, and within 14 months there were already bacteria that were resistant to that. And so there, there's a program called the Antibiotic Stewardship Program that, uh, that Medicare has put in place uh, for skilled nursing facilities and rehabilitation hospitals. And the purpose is, is they want to be able to see the proper use of antibiotics and, um, and the limitation of the use of antibiotics. And the only way that can be done is to test a patient to see whether or not, first of all, if they have a bacteria. If they don't have a bacteria, if they have a virus, then they're not going to need to be prescribed an antibiotic. There's an incredible amount of overuse um, in, the, in the 
past 30, 40 years, you would call a doctor and say, I'm coughing, and all of a sudden you'd be prescribed a Z-Pak or whatever that may be without even being tested. Let me ask you this question right here. When you go to your regular doctor, say for instance, and, and they test you and they say, well, I'm not sure if you have a bacterial infection or a viral infection. How can they tell you that fast? Well, most of the time what they're doing, and, and, and it's not a slight against the medical industry, it's the knowledge they have. They can only give you a certain amount of knowledge based upon what they're maybe seeing environmentally, right. what, what their patients are seeing. You know, you, you have kids and you come in and going, oh, this is the virus we're seeing going around. So I don't think we need our antibiotic. Or yes, this is this is something that we're, see we're hearing is going around the school. And so there's a lot of shared information where they're, where they're trying to make a logical a logical decision based upon experience more than based upon data. And right. what we're able to do is actually give you empirical data to be able to show in, a, in about a 24 hour period, yes it is a bacteria and that bacteria needs to have an antibiotic. Now, which is the right antibiotic? Because there's a, an awful lot of times we see, especially in the long term care setting, mm -hmm. where someone over a three, four month period of time may have a same UTI infection. Right. Very and right. They, we, we can determine, and that's not a hard one to be able to test for, they can see that they have a bacterial infection. An antibiotic is prescribed, but the problem is that that bacteria that's fighting doesn't care about that antibiotic. It just it's resistant to it, has no effect on it, and so cool. now it may the, slow it up just a little bit, but then right right away that UTI comes back. What our what's so important about our testing is we're now able to say yes, you have a UTI infection. It's bacteria based. Here is the antibiotics that uh, are resistant to it. But what we do is we have a team of pharmacists that interpret that test and they're able to come up with an antibiotic that's not resistant to that bacteria. Right. So then we can eradicate it and not have that same issue continue to happen. Okay, here's my question now is why is this not in every doctor's office? Well, it's, it's education. Um, education? It, 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 it really is and that's an overused term a lot of times when we come into the medical field but mm -hmm. but there are a lot of testing out there and, and unfortunately a lot of times it creates a lot of noise and what we've tried to do is be able to have uh, a test that is providing uh, all the information in one spot where you're act actually getting um, the, to find out if it's bacterial, to find out if there's resistance but then also provide you a logical solution so we like to be able to say we provide a solution, not just information. Right. And I'd like to have your website, if you don't mind, Jim. It's uh, ValenteDX.com. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back on Catherine Raker's World. He calls me googly eyes. You know you're beautiful, right? You know that? Even you are beautiful. I got bullied for wearing glasses. Share if you're against bullying. We put it out there, just took off. Three million people have shared this post. Don't let bullies get you down. I stand with you. My yeah. whole family's wearing glasses. Yay. I wear glasses and I'm proud. I even have the army on my team. All the kind comments brought my child joy. I don't feel thank you is enough. Thanks. We're back on Catherine Raker's World with our, our distinguished guest, Jim Ranker, who is the Director of Long-Term Care uh, with Valente Diagnostics. And we were talking about the Antibiotic Stewardship Program. Uh, we started talking about it. Why is, why do we have the program? And how is it going to go into effect? Well, um the main part is CMS is very concerned that the highest use percentage-wise in population of antibiotics is in the long-term care settings. Okay. So assisted living, skilled nursing, rehabilitation hospitals are the largest use of that. And so they have put in place, they know that we are 
constantly having um, new bacteria and right. when they test that bacteria they find out that it is resistant to the antibiotics that are on the market and the only way they can slow that down is that we're making sure that antibiotics are only being used right. when they should be and there shouldn't be an overuse we have had the ability to also be able to determine whether or not a drug or a, 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 a bacteria is resistant to drug classes and that will greatly reduce the overuse of antibiotics that other bacteria then can build up resistant to. For instance, my mom used to get, she was in assisted living and then nursing care, and she would be constantly getting UTIs. Mm -hmm. And they could never seem to cure it. Or she would get bronchial, or her lung would fill up, or whatever. And it just seemed like we were constantly giving her different things mm -hmm. to the point where she wasn't getting any better. And that's part of the program, isn't it? Right. It, I mean, it would be very much like if you had um, a weed killer, but you kept on putting just too much water in there. Now, right. you could spray that weed, and it might go down a little bit, but it's going to uh -huh. come back up. It's going right. to continue to do that because it's just not the proper strength or it's not really the, pro the proper chemical. Mm -hmm. What we're able to determine is looking at that exact bacteria that's causing that UTI, which uh, having our pharmacists look at it is... We bring the pharmacist in the middle of the solution versus the end. That's that, a great and, idea. And that's such a, a, an important factor of what we do, that there are so many new drugs that come on the market and so many changes that happen to medications that the, the physicians a lot of times do not have the ability to always keep up with that. So by having the pharmacist come in the middle, they can then look, and we've trained them on the bacterias that we test for right. to be able to know which antibiotic should be prescribed based upon the bacteria, which then greatly helps out the physician. So those cases where those UTIs are continuing, what happens is some of the side effects, that, that antibiotic might not a little bit of the side effect away, but it's not killing the bacteria. So that's why it comes back up. It's kind of that weed you're not getting the root out of. And you know, the sad part about it, she suffered with it. I mean, because mm -hmm. it itches, so the, there's different side effects that you get from it, right. right? Well, it's much like our wound care. That's right. Um, the, the wound care, uh, we have a, a, an amazing ability to be able to determine uh, how many different types of bacteria are within a wound. Uh, most of the time, if you have a respiratory or a UTI, a UTI you have one or two maybe primary bacteria that are in, uh, in that setting. But in a wound care setting, you could have 10 different types of bacteria because it's on the surface of the skin. What we have to first determine is which is the primary. And we're able to do that by doing what's called a pathogen load, which means looking at the bacteria inside a wound, which is the highest percentage of bacteria. And that's the first one we go after. But bacteria is pretty interesting in wounds mm -hmm. that you have two types. You have ones that are aerobic and needing oxygen and some that are anaerobic that don't need oxygen that are on the bottom of a wound. Okay. And so when we eradicate the first bacteria, we, okay. need the, we want to then retest because now the other bacteria is now getting the supply of oxygen that that one had. Can it be possible for the wound to heal but then go to the bone. Yes, that can be possible, and that, and that is one of the ones that would be deep within within a wound that would be in an anaerobic type of uh, bacteria. In order to get rid of that bacteria, what do you have to do? Open the wound? That wound would need to be need to be opened up. Well, you could be giving ant antibiotic if you knew which one that was. The difficulty is is a a, um, a pill form or even intravenous has to go through the entire body to try to find where that bacteria is. Um, so the most effective way um, in, in when we find a bacteria is ac actually be able to put a topical antibiotic because you're getting 100 times the dose because you're applying it directly to the bacteria. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Um, when you go in to have any kind of surgery, wouldn't you want to be tested for, especially if you're going in for a hip replacement or anything that they have, that you're going to have a wound. Why wouldn't you be tested before that, especially if you're on Medicare? Yeah, there, there are many ways of testing uh, physicians. Some physicians will do nasal swabs to see if there's MRSA uh, there, and then there can be other ways of checking for infectious disease to be able to see, and then especially after to be able to make sure that wound is healing properly. Right. Is um, You can have sometimes up to about 20% of wounds that will 
close slow due to the, the infections uh, on there, and, and so the ability to test afterwards is very important. Okay, so you test every six weeks then, is that correct? Well, for a patient who has an open wound. A so wound. diabetic ulcers um, last year were an $83 billion uh, issue uh, in healthcare. And because they close so slowly, it allows new bacteria to grow. And so you want to be able to, when, when you have figured out the proper antibiotic to kill the highest pathogen load bacteria, you want to be able to retest because something else is going to take its place. And, then, and as that's slowly closing, we're wanting to continue to figure out which bacteria are now growing, that we can eradicate those, and sometimes they, they're going to call for a different antibiotic than what killed the first one. And that's why it needs to be retested to see where those loads are, are we reducing them, and then being prepared for what, what may come next after that. What's the longest wound you experienced? Well, one, one of the companies we work with actually is a wound care company and they had a, um, one of their executives actually had two open wounds that were very painful where sometimes he couldn't even come to work. And when we were talking about doing some initial piloting testing with their company, we, um, he said, well, hold on, we don't need to do that. I've got two wounds that are so severe that sometimes I can't work, I'm in such pain. And so we tested both of those, and what we end up finding out is the first bacteria is each wound had a higher concentration of different bacteria. And so we had two different topical ointments, uh, antibiotic ointments that were done on each wound. And that ended up uh, closing that by 50% in a six month period with wounds that he had open for multiple years. Wow. Unbelievable. So how m it healed 50%, did you say? 50% in six months. Six months. And so his pain, he says, sometimes would be at a 9 to a 10, and he's down to a 3 or 4, and slowly closing up. So he really believes in... Yes. Oh, yes. yes. So let me ask you this. When did ASP come into effect? Well, the, there's, three, there's three phases uh, that CMS has, has changes in the long-term care setting. They haven't done that in 25 years, and so there's new rules that came in place for hospital readmissions, and, they, and the second phase was the infectious control, which the antibiotic stewardship program right. comes into place. That was put into place in November, November 28th of 2017. Okay. Um, but the skilled nursing industry felt very ill-prepared for that, and so they lobbied to have an 18-month moratorium on the penalty phase. So they're under the antibiotic stewardship right now that when uh, CMS comes in to check to see how they're doing, but they're not under the penalty phase of that uh, wow. until this May. So in May, if they don't have an antibiotic stewardship program in place, they get penalized? Well, when they're reviewed, yeah. So when, when they have state surveyors that come in to see if they're meeting CMS standards on a lot of different things, not just antibiotic stewardship, but antibiotic stewardship will be one of the programs that they, that they will be graded on. And those penalties can be reduction in star rating, they can be civil penalties, they can be reduction in admissions, or even possibly their Medicare certificate taken away. But if they bring the program in, what happens? Right. The, the, the nice part is it's a, it's a very hard, hard measurable um, in what they're doing now. Most facilities are going to have hand washing protocols or if they suspect a patient is maybe having a viral or a uh, infection, a bacterial infection, they're going to isolate that patient, maybe take out their roommate, they're, they're not there, so they're not trying to spread it throughout the, the entire facility. What we're able to do though is we can give empirical data. So for instance, if in one month we tested 24 patients, we can say that 22 of them had a bacterial infection, 11 of them had an antibiotic resistance, and then we can show what was actually prescribed. And then with that type of data, the state surveyors are very satisfied that they're meeting the standard for antibiotic stewardship. Wow. And that would really help them not getting a penalty. Yes. Right? yes. That's important. So tell me, um, how will this be done at the SFN level? On the skilled nursing, we, we come in, um, and the, the nice part is they're using a test now called culture and sensitivity. Oh, and, yes. And, we and, all and, know what that yes, is. Yes. Those the, the old ones, the old Petri dishes that you see and rubbed across both ways to see what, see what is growing. 
that has been a wonderful test that's been around for over 200 years. 200 it's abso years. absolutely amazing um, that we've had that much of technology, but it is antiquated uh, because it does not give that much information and it takes a long time to grow. Sometimes it can be three, four, five, even sometimes a, a, over a week to see if it's growing or not. And mean, meantime, do you give an antibiotic? Do you not? Do you isolate the patient? What do you, what do, you do? Our test we're able to do is you can get an answer within about 24 to 36 hours all the way to the prescription of what's needed to do. And our collection process is much easier. Um, the collection now uh, on some tests that they're doing have to be refrigerated, have to be time sensitive to bring it in. We don't care because we actually have a chemical inside our bags that actually helps kill the bacteria because we, we can't test it until it's dead. And so that makes the shipping easier, it makes the collection process much easier for the staff to be able to get the sample. Or we come in and actually have collectors that will come in and get it for them. Well, you know, I want to have you come back and talk again about this because it's such an interesting subject and I think everyone, including your doctor, yourself, you know, if you have uh, a relative that is in a nursing home or in assisted living, you really want to take care of them and they want to be taken care of. Because like with us, with my mom, she was in uh, nursing care for five years. Prior to that, she was in assisted living and she was always getting UTI. She was always getting these different things. Where can people go to get more information? Well, you'd want to go to uh, Valente DX. Uh, dot com to be able to look at more information that if it's something that you're concerned about for you, your family, this can be done um, on from an infant to elder care and everyone in between. So whether it's your pediatrician, whether it, it would be someone in the wound care industry, a podiatrist, whether it's a gastro uh, physician, uh, anything within between there, uh, urologist can, can be done in the long-term care setting because uh, a patient could be so susceptible to antibiotic resistance okay. that is even very much more important there because of the number of medications they are on. Right. I want to thank you so much right. for joining us today. I appreciate today. It being invited. Thank and you. And give that website out one more time. It's uh, ValenteDX.com. And we'll be back uh, next time on Katherine Raker's World. Thank you.